Hello and in our last who's who of watchmaking we looked at Hermes and how its acquisition of a 25% stake in Vaucher Manufacture allowed them to leave from fashion watchmaker to haute horlogerie. So it makes sense to follow with that uh, with uh, Parmigiani Fleurier, the relatively young watch brand set by restorer Michel Parmigiani. And the reason we go over them still in this early stage of our who's who's uh, series is that Parmigiani is much more than simply a brand. It's a proper group, a much smaller one of course than the likes of of Richemont, Swatch, LBMH, but nevertheless a pretty well orchestrated and powerful one when it comes to mastering all the various complementary watchmaking competencies and this is what we will uncover now. But first, you can't really have a discussion about Parmigiani Fleurier and its significance in the watch world without talking about the Sando Foundation. This is the investment foundation set up by the sculptor and painter Edouard Marcel Sando in 1964, which aims to encourage Swiss entrepreneurs and which has interests in such diverse areas as financial services, hotels, telecommunication, graphic arts, and very importantly, pharmaceuticals. Here, it's a strong industry in Switzerland. Excellent. Until 1996, this foundation didn't have any interest, meaning stakes in the world of watchmaking, but that's when it decided to invest in the business of Michel Parmigiani, who ran a small business restoring horological masterpieces and occasionally making one-off pieces for collectors under the name Parmigiani Mesure et Art du Temps. Michel Parmigiani was a watch restorer by trade, having set up a workshop in Couvet in the Val de Travers, not far away from Fleurier, in the canton of Neuchâtel in the late 70s. Michel Parmigiani was already very well respected, having done uh, restorations for the Patek Philippe Museum and the Kremlin uh, Museum, as well as having worked on the likes of uh, Breguet's uh, Pendule Sympathique and Fabergé Peacock Egg, to name a few. He also dabbled in making unique pieces for collectors as well as supplying complicated pieces such as minute repeaters and perpetual calendars for the likes of Breguet, Vacheron Constantin and Chaumet. So already quite a solid track record. Michel Parmigiani came to the attention of the Sando family when in 1980 he was asked to become the official restorer of the collection of watchmaking artifacts the family owned and this is a pretty serious collection. So rumor has it that it was a shared desire to boost the watchmaking economy in Fleurier, in the Val de Travers, following the, the disastrous effect of the quartz crisis, that saw the Sando Foundation invest in Michel Parmigiani's burgeoning watch brand, taking a controlling 51% stake. In 1996, the company name was changed to Parmigiani Fleurier, uh, that's where it's located, and by 1999, the first watch under this moniker was launched, the Calpa Hebdomadaire. It was a bold piece with a tonneau shaped case, beautifully finished movement, and eight day of power reserve, which explains the name because hebdomadaire in French means weekly. Like F.P. Journe or George Daniels, Michael and his team crafted their vision of the future by dissembling the watches of the past. For example, it was a 19th century Perrin Frère pocket watch that inspired the Toric Capitol minute repeater, which was launched in 2011. While in 2014 Parmigiani showed the prototype of the oval pantograph, whose telescopic hands were inspired by an oval-shaped pocket watch created in uh, 1800 by two English watchmakers, Vardon and Stedman, and which uh, Parmigiani had restored uh, the this precise cl uh, clock back in 1997. So this oval pantograph is now fully part of the collection, and this year the brand introduced a full gold movement version, again paying tribute to the past and the origins of fine watchmaking. As interesting as the watches are, and when you look at some of the ones created as part of the brand's uh, partnership with Bugatti, for instance, which is still ongoing after 13 years, well, uh, they are certainly very innovative indeed, but what is most uh, uh, noteworthy is what uh, Parmigiani, thanks to the buying power of the Sando Foundation, was able to achieve over the next 20 years. Self-sufficiency to the tune of close to 95% with only the sapphire crystals and some of the straps being made by third parties, mainly Hermes. Here you see the connection again. So the main objective with this strategy was to guarantee access to the finest quality components for 
or the Parmigiani brand. Because at the time there was some uh, serious issues regarding know-how that was slowly disappearing. But from the start they knew that uh, setting up such a network would be too big for the brand itself and therefore all these competencies uh, were to rely on the business standpoint, also on outside brands requiring these skills and level of quality. So the Parmigiani Group had to become a trustworthy supplier of the industry. So from 2000 to 2005, the Sando Foundation went on a spending spree with the aim uh, being to create a vertical watchmaking operation. In 2000, it acquired MBBS, which it uh, renamed Atokalpa, derived from the Greek word from atom, and the Sanskrit from biggest. So a company that is specializing in the production of traditional gears for movement. And by 2006, Atokalpa was able to produce all the components needed to make an oscillator, including the spring balance, the pallet fork, and escaping uh, wheel train. So this is is seriously a real watchmaking feat mastered by very few companies, even today. So next up was Les Artisans Boitiers, a high-end case-making company based in La Chaux-de-Fonds. And this was followed by Elwin, and both these uh, last two were bought into the fold in 2001. Elwin already supplied higher quality screws, levers and pins to Parmigiani, but in 2001 it was officially made a part of the Soundo Foundation watchmaking center. By 2003, Vaucher was formed when the movement side of Parmigiani was separated out from the watchmaking element, allowing the group to be able to supply the likes of Hermes, as well as making its own in-house movements naturally. The final rung on the investment ladder was Cadrance and Habillage, the luxury dial maker, which is rumored to still supply the likes of some very big names of the industry, and that was acquired in 2005. So Parmigiani uh, now had everything it needed to make a staring proportion of its watches totally in-house. This vertical approach to investing, creating comprehensive supply chains in order to ensure self-sufficiency, is a common theme for the Soundo Foundation, and thought to have been uh, partly down to Pierre Landolt, chairman of the Soundo Foundation, and also chairman at uh, Vaucher and Elwin and vice chair at uh, Parmigiani. So Landolt uh, became interested in sustainability and self-sufficiency, albeit in a more traditional agricultural sense, when he spent time in Brazil running a farm that uh, he bought following a posting in Sao Paulo as part of the Soundo uh, Pharmaceutical Company. Another thing Landolt has been instrumental in is the commitment to uh, apprenticeship uh, schemes that each of the companies that form the foundation's watchmaking division uh, offer as a way of encouraging the local youth to pursue a career in luxury watchmaking. A move that not only ensures that these traditions are not lost, but that these uh, various companies are supporting the local economy. Well, in other words, uh, the very definition of sustainability. While Parmigiani started its life as a very much and high-end watchmaker, the recent economic pressures have seen it explore more entry-level options by offering its iconic tonde uh, in steel, for instance, and uh, as time only also, so something that we recently saw at the SIHH. But uh, they continue to propose very exclusive watches and clocks, but they are also looking into the future. And as we know, for instance, that uh, Vaucher Manufacture is pursuing in its quest for some serious horological breakthrough with a revolutionary escapement system called the Senfini, uh, Senfine, sorry, meaning without an N in Italian. This system, uh, also known under the name Genecon escapement, could have a massive impact on power reserve issues. And they are talking about uh, objective sets at more than 40 days of power reserve. I've even heard much more than that actually. This development is done conjointly with the local lab from Neuchâtel and I like the idea that despite coming from this traditional watchmaking environment, well, it doesn't prevent these people to think and explore outside the box, something nevertheless quite uh, in tune with what watchmaking was all about uh, some 200 years ago when it was still considered a science. Well, anyhow, this shifting market and tougher environment for all watchmakers hasn't been selling uh, uh, any stake in the business, but a bit of necessary restructuring and redimensioning. But all in all, it still means that it remains one of the few truly independent brand and group on the scene, and this is something that is to be admired and respected. One thing I wanted to add about Parmigiani is that it's quite an original brand. I know it's not so well known, but for connoisseurs, most of them uh, would acknowledge the, the seriousness of their 
watchmaking commitment. But uh, another aspect that uh, reflects this originality is that when most brands will associate themselves with very high-end profile events and sports, such as Formula One, whatever, well, Parmigiani has a different take on this and, for instance, has been involved in the world of hot air balloons for quite some time now. They not only have their own uh, branded balloon, but have supported quite a few events around the, the world with the idea to do things differently. And when we know uh, Michel Parmigiani's relationship uh, with nature, well, the inspiring role it has on him, well, you can only think at what, it really, uh, what he's really looking at from all the way up there. And of course, for this special who's who, well, I had to wear my very own Parmigiani Tonda 1950. And here you can see this special relationship they have with Hermes, as Hermes doesn't provide any other brand with their straps. So this is it for our presentation of the Parmigiani Group. So one brand and five suppliers of the industry. And I'll come back shortly on some kind of recap of all those main power groups that we've talked about over the last few who's who of watchmaking before going into or diving, I should say, into the history of each individual brand. See you very soon.